Welcome to my MACD life and powered by the Support Sight Foundation. This podcast is about macular degeneration and the devastating impact it has on millions of people and their families every single day, 365 days a year. Our mission is simple, to bring hope, optimism, perspective, and education to our listeners. So tune in, buckle up, and put your listening ears on. Here are your hosts, Don Prawl and Sean Doyle. Hello, everyone, and welcome to my MACD Life. I'm your co-host, Sean Doyle, professional speaker, trainer, and book author. And I'm here today with my co-host, the lovely and talented, the amazing, the incredible, the irreplaceable, Don Prawl, the founder and executive director of the Support Site Foundation and a visionary. Hey, Don. Hey, Sean. Hi, everyone. We're happy you've joined us. We're excited to bring you some great information, education, and inspiration. We really want to make a difference in the life of people who are suffering with MACD, and we call it My MACD Life. And Don, one other thing. What's that, Sean? We're We're going going to to have have fun. fun. (laughs) In this episode of My MACD Life, we're going to explore the process and importance of audio production, audiobooks and podcasts, and how they impact the lives of those who are sight impaired, visually impaired, or are living with MACD. Support for today's My MACD Life podcast comes from Healthy Vision Association, Novartis, The Sparrow, Centric Bank, and Hinkelstein and Associates. You know, I've done a lot of things in my uh, production career and my life. I'm a husband. I'm a father. I'm a musician. I'm a composer and producer for film, radio, and TV. Uh, But I started this company without really understanding and uh, knowing how deeply I can affect the lives of uh, people who are visually impaired or living with MACD through the work we do at at Autovita Studios. And uh, it's just been profoundly, profoundly satisfying to meet you, Dawn, and to learn about this whole other aspect of what we were already doing. So I'm grateful to you for kind of guiding us into this world where we're now serving this population, not only with the podcast, but also with the work we do in audiobooks. Folks, that's my wonderful, dear friend, David Wolf. Uh, David Wolf is principal at AudioVita. David and his team are our true blue partners in creating MACD, my MACD life. And you've heard it from him. This is part of a journey and that that came to a cro- uh what we, yeah an intersection we just kind of landed on each other there you go an intersection and all of a sudden the idea of doing a podcast about macular degeneration popped into your life and you were crazy about it from the mm. beginning yes it was tell people it was why. love at first sight i mean listen <laughs> uh, sight yes, get it <laughs> everything we do is audio i mean we're really not well we are audio. That's what we do. And we are all about creating experiences for listeners. I talk about it all the time, the listener experience. And we're about creating visual elements in the theater of the mind, in the mind's eye. And for those who can't see, the mind's eye is where it's all happening. So uh, you'll learn in this episode, the actors we work with when we do audiobooks, it's all in the mind's eye. The stories that are told and through the interviews or the other experiences we uh, produce on podcasts for a, a variety of clients are all, it's all about a very intimate, focused listening experience. And you and your team, I, I just want to do a shout out, are like part of the family. They're the best. Everyone cares very much about what they do and what they add to the experience in my MACD life. And I couldn't be more grateful or proud or honored to be working with you guys. And you have helped us launch this brand new idea, award-winning podcast in a very, in an incredible way. And I just want to thank you and let our and our listeners need to know that you're the guy behind it and your team. And I think one other thing that I'd love you to tell our listeners is your passion comes out. You have passion for this. You're crazy about it. You and I talk 
on the weekends at night? Where, why and where at this point in your life do you get that? Well, you know, as you get to a certain age, right, what becomes important the changes, right? So for me yep. personally, at one point, I was writing music for radio, TV, film, this and that and the other. And, and creative generation is largely, it's an artistic endeavor. And that is by nature kind of a self-centered idea. You're alone, you're writing, mm. you're satisfying your own creative uh, uh, intuition. You're hearing it played by musicians in my particular case. It, it was very, very gratifying and satisfying, but it is all about me at that level. It has a, There's a narcissistic <laughs> kind of context to that. Here now, as I'm moving into my 60s and I'm um, uh, building a team that cares, as you've said, and thank you for that, and I feel that too from them all the time, a project like yours just takes it to another level because it, it, it's it's we've got the team and we all love and care, but now we're really serving a population with meaningful content to really get the word out about MACD and to help educate and uh, to be a part of facilitating that is very gratifying for this particular chapter in my life. It would have been at any chapter, but this is my experience with you now working on it. So David, Yes. Here's where we're going with this conversation today, because it is about macular degeneration, as everyone who's listening knows. Or if you're listening and you haven't figured that out, now you know. David, we met because you are an expert in what you do, and that is? I founded a company that is dedicated to audio production. So everything we do is with sound in some way or another. And this so closely aligns with the world, the population, the, the project that you brought to me when we got together to do my MACD life, right? Yeah. So it's, it's a confluence of dedicated to sound and dedicated to vision. Exactly. And then where we come together, because when you lose your vision, the number one thing that happens is that you have difficulty reading. You're challenged by that. And because macular degeneration is a progressive eye disease, and again, everyone's different, your capacity or ability to read most likely will diminish over time. So people who've been living with macular degeneration for, let's say, 10 years mm -hmm. are in a very different place in terms of reading than people who maybe were just recently diagnosed and have early stages. But it really ah. depends on the individual, and it's a central vision disease. So it blocks your central vision. So your brain's ability to fill in letters, it, it, it lessens. Your brain can't do it. And, you, yeah. and so the topic at hand and the industry that you're in, bringing in the audio, is huge for people who are visually impaired. No, it's amazing. You know, and until I met you, I, I have to say that I wasn't fully aware of the impact that we're having on people that are visually impaired. I mean, and that's really what this particular episode is, is about. And uh, largely it's about saying, well, look, you know, for the sighted population, we know we're doing things like helping people get free from screens, pages. Listen while you drive that nasty commute. Exactly. Yeah. They can multitask. They don't have to uh, be tied to a chair and reading. Maybe the sense that they have time scarcity and this helps them multitask, as you've said. Uh, but there are so many powerful elements about the work we do that deeply and powerfully impacts the lives of uh, the population you're serving. That's right. So people who are losing their vision have been listening to books, whether they've been read to by a caregiver or a loved one, mm. or whether they've got the books on tape from the Library for the Blind, you know, the cassette players. And they've been doing this for a long time. So fast forward to 20. I mean, when, when, when did the audio, when did this industry really start? Well, it's funny you should ask. So I did have a few notes here to just share with uh, those that are listening because it's, it's quite powerful. The audio consumption market is growing exponentially across all the genres in audio. It's outpacing ebooks. As we sit together, it's a $1.2 billion industry. Billion with a B? Billion with a B. Mm. It's growing at more than 25% year over year since 2013. Wow. That's incredible. It's explosive. What do you what do you attribute that to? 
most of the activity we do is relating to the shift from sitting and reading, which we were talking about a moment ago. People have a perceived, they perceive that they have less time to sit and read. So there's a perceived scarcity of time that may be driving the market. And the other thing is, is that the technology, the hypermobile in this of, of everything with cell phones has just made this a very portable industry where you don't have to sit in a living room with a stereo, but you can be on the go while you consume content. Some people process information. I'm talking about sighted population where they have a choice or more of a choice. They, they, they process information more readily or easily with audio than they do visually. It's, it's fascinating. It is fascinating. You know, we need to bring somebody on. Wait, wait. I think we have some a few people on we this just show. Might. We, just we might. have some more experts going to talk about this. So let's roll this up in a way that segues to our listeners to explain why did we think that this might be an interesting topic for our visually impaired listeners as well as our listeners who are sighted. Yeah. I mean, we're freeing people from screens, pages, anything visual. We're giving them a choice in how they consume content for the sighted population. But for the, those that are visually impaired or can't read at all, audiobooks are amazing in that they're an inclusive medium. Now, the visually impaired, that population can use these audiobooks quite easily and, quote, read any book they like that's in audio. And almost so many of them are. I would say that most are released in both audio and in ebook and in print. There's also, and I've observed this as a producer, there's an intimacy about audio. It's a very primal thing to have stories read to you. You know, it's the first thing your your mother did, for example, you know, it's a very primal kind of way to experience story and narrative. The other thing that I think is quite fascinating about audio, and all, my whole team is really excited about this, including uh, Steve and Kim, who will be joining us shortly. With audio, you're able to create a visual image in your mind's eye from the work we do, telling the story, acting the parts of the characters, narrating the action sequences, painting that picture in the mind's eye. So that's a very powerful aspect of this. And certainly for a population of those living with MACD, you know, it, it allows it them to visual it. Yeah, they're doing they do it, already. it already. It just plays into it. Exactly, darling. Yeah, yep. they're doing it already. Yeah, it's interesting. So here we go. Let's bring our... Very, very special guests on. We have with us today Kim Monty and Steve Corona. Uh, both are actors, uh, casting directors, dialect coaches. They teach people how to do audiobook narration, and they do a lot of audiobook narration themselves. They're here to kind of share from their point of view how all this works, what it means, what they bring to it, how they think about it. Behind the scenes, look at producing audiobooks and narrating them and, and acting in audiobooks. So welcome to you both. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Hi, Steve and Kim. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today on uh, My MACD Life. We think this is going to be a really cool segment because I've thought about it while I'm listening to my audiobook. Like, how they do that? What does that? What does that voice look like? How do they change characters? You know, all those kinds. It's magic. It's magic, just like story. And I want to piggy. I want to start by piggybacking off of something that our wonderful David said: storytelling. Because in the end of the day, it is life is about stories. And of course, we encourage our the millions of people out there who live with macular degeneration and their caregivers to tell their stories. It creates a fabric, a tapestry of sharing. So let's start with that. When you are telling the story as the voice actor, Steve, let's start with you. Give us your little snippet on how, how did you become a voice actor? Well, I trained in theater. And I have listen to his voice, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I have a background in theater, and then I got into film. I started doing some film acting, and I just always really enjoyed all the things that you could do with your voice. I studied dialects in college and became a dialects coach, actually. So I learned how to teach other people, you know, for example, how to speak in, in different dialects, right? So because I, I really enjoyed doing that, I thought, well, maybe I could use that as an actor and play multiple characters in a story and just act with my voice. So I started looking into, into voiceover. I started back in 2006 
So I've been doing it for a while and I'm really enjoying it. So give us one more. This is fun. So you can go in and out of dialect all during the interview. It'll be, it'll add some real texture to it. How about that? Kim, tell us your story, how you got started. There, there's two pieces to it. One is I'm one of those kids that when they're growing up, they take the book and the flashlight under the covers. And then about midnight, my parents come in and go, what are you doing? Was it Nancy Drew? Oh, among many, the Jungle Books, Rudyard Kibling, you know, you name it, all kinds of things. Uh, they actually took my books away from me. Ooh. That's my addiction. <laughs> I also had a grandmother who had, my maternal grandmother, who had been the head librarian of the Case Western Reserve Library. This woman was amazing. She knit, she did textiles, she did all kinds of things. She had macular degeneration. Wow. And she would still continue to knit from patterns she'd memorized. And she would listen to audiobooks. And she had a cassette recorder that, you know, was definitely bigger than a bread box. Yeah, it could fit in the garage, probably. It could fit, yeah, comfortably or a little tightly, depending on your garage. <laughs> and so she would get these boxes of tapes. She actually got a phone call from them because they said, how in the heck are you going through all these tapes? She goes, I used to run a library. And they're like, no problem. How many do you need? So I got exposed to this when I was very, very small. And I always thought that was very cool. And the thing I like about audiobooks is whoever you are, you can create what the character looks like. You get the basic description from the author, but you decide how tall the palm trees are. You decide how green the grass is. Or if you live out in the Southwest, not green the grass is. Um, so, But you paint these pictures. That's why some of the classic novels like Lord of the Rings... Everyone was filled with fear, trepidation, angst. What if they don't look like what I see them as? And so that was, that was, as we know, that came out pretty well. But you get to paint the picture. And then to have and to give someone access to knowledge. I'm a geek. Uh, I'm a research chemist by training and degree. And, you know, to be able to open up knowledge and experience to people and give people an independence it's one thing to have somebody sit and read to you, but you're tying up both your times. But now you can learn anything you want. You can go anywhere in the world you want. You want to listen to a book about Hawaii? You want to listen to a book about the Antarctica? It's there. And the collections are getting bigger and deeper, which is just marvelous. Absolutely. Well, thank you. And the story about your grandmother is it's incredible. And, you know, Folks who are listening know macular degeneration one and four have some degree of it or over the age 65. And I knew when, when we were deciding to do this segment, there had to be a connection to macular degeneration somewhere between all of us, uh, you know, besides me and David, right? So thank you for that. And what a great role model your grandmother was. So, David, you want to throw a question out to uh, one of our guests here? Thank you, Don. There's so much to think about when you're doing voicing of a book. What is what is the most challenging aspect of it? You do a wide, you both are doing a wide range of work, but what are, what's the most challenging piece as you crawl into a project as a single voice narrator on a book? Sure, yeah. Um, well, obviously, if there's multiple characters, the creation of the characters. We want them to, there, there needs to be vocal separation. You need to be able to tell the characters apart. Uh, so that's everything from gender to accent, pitch, pacing, tone, all of it. So we spend a lot of time going through and developing the characters. There's also the more daunting part for me anyway, is putting the list together of all the words that we need to make sure we're saying correctly. Mm, give us an example of that. Oh my yeah. gosh. Well, Kim can speak better to that. Uh, she had a book that was, <laughs> it was, she had a list as long as her arm of all the different words that she needed pronounced for her. It's very important that we get that up front to save us a lot of time on the back end. So Kim, do you want to segue into talking about <laughs> making sure we have our pronunciation guides? Yeah, because pronunciation uh, can be regionally specific. It can be country specific. But then you have 
the genre of sci-fi. And you have entire, if anybody is, knows about Star Trek and the Klingon language, you've got entirely made-up languages and made-up words. So we have to go back to the author. And one of the things we've done, for sanity's sake, purely, is ask the authors to give us an audio recording. There's all kinds of ways to diagram out how to pronounce something and whether it is potato, potato. But when we get the recording from the actor, because often it's in a particular locality, and it may be as simple as where the author grew up, they know what these words should sound like. And then being auditory sensitive, which bo most voiceover actors are, you can pick that up far faster than trying to translate, you know, diagrammatic hieroglyphs, hieroglyphics on how to pronounce something. And it's, it makes a difference. It has to flow smoothly because you can't stop and sound it out. You, you don't want to hiccup over it. And both Steve and I, I happen to know this, is we will go through the sentences over and over and over again so that it comes out smooth. So you would never know we don't speak that terminology. So you're not just reading. You're not just reading the book to and recording it. You're actually, you, you spent, you read it first. How do you prepare? Which is what I think you're going to. Like, I think my impression was you just opened up the book and started talking. <laughs> not quite. You know? Not quite. I mean, sometimes I, I do that a little bit. I'll, I'll do more of a cursory skim, I guess, more more than, than uh, other narrators do. But that's just because I've been doing it long enough. I'm comfortable with that. I still like to know what are my words that I have no idea how to pronounce. So let's get those down. Like, give us an example of those. Oh, though. man. Like, okay, so that? I just did a book where there was a lot of Hebrew. Hebrew words and names, locations that I was not familiar with. So I had to make sure that I got those from the author. And, and, and you could do some amount of looking it up on your own, you know, Google Translate, things like that. But you can't always rely on that because sometimes that's not going to pronounce it the correct way. And sometimes there are three to seven acceptable pronunciations. Ah, exactly. Which one does the author prefer? Yeah, that's that's so true. Exactly. How engaged are the authors? Do they listen to the whole thing while you're taping it and stuff, or what do they do? I can jump in on that one. So yeah. typically they are not a part of the recording session process itself. What we do is we have checkpoints so that the author can check and make sure we've got things dialed in. It's the right pace. The characters are dialed in well in terms of how the author envisioned that they may sound. Mm. Sometimes we have situations where I think we're working on a project now where the author has told us boldly that he's been hearing these voices of these characters for many, many years. So then we're challenged with trying to eh, essentially satisfy what they've been hearing in their head, but still bring it to life in a whole new way with the particular actors that we're casting for the project. So there are some challenges around the difference between the author's auditory, you know, vision of what it ought to be, if you will, and what we actually bring to life in the recording process. But typically we, we do it in a, in a, in a clean room and then we show them where we are and we, we allow them to get some input, Steve. Yeah. And if I could uh, jump on that. So typically, right, there's a lot more space between when we record and when the author listens and we get feedback and do another round. What I loved was a slightly different process. We did a book last year with David's good friend, Irv, The First Dog on Earth. Amazing book, so well written. And what I loved about that process was it was a lot closer working back and forth with Irv as the author. I could send him a chapter. He would listen and give me immediate feedback so that I could, you know, make sure that I was on track all throughout and I was satisfying what he wanted from me. And <laughs> just a real fun story with that, if I could. Irv, I loved this. Speaking about a minute ago, you, you, we were talking about why are audiobooks becoming, you know, a huge thing? And I think part of it, too, is it's sort of hearkening back to that sort of golden age of radio. And, and I love uh -huh, this was probably uh -huh. the best compliment I ever got a as an audiobook narrator. Irv told me that he said he loved hearing the chapters as I was sending them out. And he said he felt like a kid sitting in his uh, treehouse, listening to the radio, waiting for the next chapter to come, the next episode of this story. Even though he wrote the story, he knew it what was coming. He couldn't wait to hear my interpretation, my performance of it. 
And I'll say that Irv was a, he recently deceased, so I say was, uh, he was an advertising guy on Madison Avenue. So he was used to production and used to writing a script and then taking it into a studio. Many authors are not used to that process until right. they've done it a few times and learned that there's a difference between what they've put on the page and what will actually be brought to life. I, I wanted to dig into a little something that might be really interesting, Dawn, um, for those listening when you're an actor and you do have to differentiate character from character, what are some of the techniques you use to create that differentiation? There's a there's a scope of things you can do with your voice. Part of it's talking about how you do it, and we want to hear some examples, if you don't mind. No, you know, sometimes you just have to put some time on the job, and you just have to really... Um, um, what, what's, what's the word? Organize your thoughts. Yeah, I have a little problem with that sometimes. And you just pull it together. And you read, you take all of the bits that the author gives you. Because sometimes, sometimes that's all you've got to go on is a couple sentences or maybe the age of the character. And, you know, um, some kids just, They've got, they've just got to get on it and, and you've got to jump on it yeah, and, and get going because there's a deadline. There's always deadlines, deadlines, deadlines. And ask David, he knows all about deadlines. I don't know nothing about deadlines. <laughs> <laughs> no, you take, you do, but you do, you get all this information from the author. And so as Steve mentioned earlier, it's pitch, it's pace, it's tone, it's, what are you doing with your mouth? Where do you talk with your mouth? Are you talking out your lips? Or are you talking back in your throat? Because if you go back in your throat... Don't forget about dialects and accents, you know? No, 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 my friend. It is so good to have the dialects. I'm talking over here. <laughs> oh, man. And, 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 okay, so Kim and David know about this. I just did a book with, I don't know, Kim, what, 35 plus characters in it. And they were from all over the world. So that took a long time. And, you know, creating different little sample tracks that I can come back to and listen to. Like, wait a minute. I haven't heard this guy for three chapters. What does he sound like again? Oh, yeah, that's right. He's this guy. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. oh no, wait. That's, so you gotta create, well, yeah. that's too high. I got to bring him down now. Okay, he's this guy. Yeah, right. So you're really creating your own glossary. You're creating a character. Maybe you're getting it approved by the producer or the author, and then you're, you've you got to be consistent throughout, right? Yeah. No, usually you do. The one I did last year, which was a big challenge, because not only were there 40-some different characters that weren't all in the same chapter, thank God, but <laughs> they had seven main characters that were all women between the age of 16 and 21. And, and so I had to come up with seven voices in the same age range, and you did it off personality. I had personality traits that the author gave me. One of the girls was rather um, just very self-assured. She goes, just to ask her, she knew about it. Everything she said, she, there, there was nothing she didn't know. And so you get that. But when you're dealing with seven characters in that age range, that's how you make the difference. And you do. We do keep an audio glossary so that you can go back to and go, oh, my gosh, what, what was that? Was that how fast did she? Go? Oh, OK, got it. And you play it and you got it. I was going to are there physical things you do outside of the oral. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Right. But talk a little bit about that to, to kind of yeah, anchor the sound. That. Right. That's one of the things I don't think people realize is how incredibly physical audio books are and any type of voiceover work. Because if you're running, you've got to get mowing because you've got to have those voices. And, oh, my gosh, that monster was chasing me. <sighs> and you do that and you're in there. And if you're if you got a guy that's pumping iron, you know, Steve, give it. Give us your <laughs> pumping iron. <clears throat> right. You got to make all those effort noises. Oh, all the grunt noises. Yeah. <laughs> Drop away. <laughs> oh, oh. But, but <laughs> I love it. I love it. But also, also there, there's those physical characteristics. So it's not just when you're doing action, but also just yeah. taking on the physical characteristics of the characters. So, you know, I remember one of the characters. Okay, so like the hero of the story, you know, I, I kind of picture him heroic. He's 
standing upright. He's got a good posture, you know, chest wide open. And then there's there's this older guy, and he kind of is he's a little more hunched in, and he's got. Uh, I'm not even doing the accent. Let's see what well, he was like uh, Eastern European, and he was like you know very sort of uh, like this, and, uh, and and so so that that physical posture affects the voice, and, and it helps you get into mentally also the character too. So that helps when you're going back and forth having a conversation between multiple people. You're like, ah, I take on this characteristic. Now I'm standing upright and I'm this character. And and then you can drop back into neutral and be the narrator. That's great because we're, you know, for folks who know podcast recording, you can see each other and we're, I'm watching Steve change his body. And Kim, they're changing their body as they're telling this, what they, you know, this, the, giving us the answers here. And you look very different. I mean, somebody told me, emailed me the other day and said, I really love you on the podcast because I can hear you smile. That is the number one biggest emotion that comes out is a smile and no joke. And if you have somebody that says, I love you versus I love you, yeah. it comes, that is the one that transfers all across the world. And it really doesn't matter what language you speak and whether English is your first or your seventh or eighth language the smiles come across. And that's one of the things we're taught from day one as an actor, let alone a voice actor. You are both stage and screen experienced actors because it's not visual in terms of what you're delivering to the performance. Um, There's no stage. Uh, do you, yeah. You have to, do you find that you need to exaggerate the vocal aspects or do you just play it as naturally as it, as though you were on stage or in film anyway? I, I tend to make it, it depend on the character. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I think it depends. It depends on the genre. It depends on the specific character speaking. Definitely. Mm -hmm. But I think overall mm -hmm. I do exaggerate a little bit physically because that helps me express it a little more clearly vocally, whatever I'm doing. So that's just me. I, I tend to push it a little bit bigger. I'm a little bigger personality as it is to start with. So uh, yeah, coming from stage, you know, every Everything's big. Everything's huge. Everything's over the top. <laughs> right. Yay. Everything's a yay. yay. Yeah, exactly. Well, yay. If you stop and think about it, when you have a visual medium in front of you, be it a podcast, movie, whatever, you have your body, you have your facial expressions, you have your voice, you have your hands. You know, um, when I was growing up, my teachers would say, Kim, stop talking so much. Sit on your hands, please. <laughs> it worked every time. Shut your mouth. Sit on your hands. Yeah, it worked every time. It was very disappointing. Uh -huh. But when you're doing the voiceover, you have to find a way that you have to move all of your vo your body movements, all of your feelings, all your facial expressions. You have to, to, you know, it's kind of fearful, but you have to kind of just, you know, bring it all together and, and talk about, I think there's a monster behind me, and, and I really should look, but... Oh, I don't want to look. I don't want to look. <gasps> There's nobody there. Oh, my gosh. I'm okay. And you have to bring it. all of that. Yeah, it, it's like, I, uh, it. I, I know, David, you've said this before, and I, I know I've heard it somewhere else, too, but it's like the theater of the mind, right? Because you're visualizing everything that you can't see because it is only audio. Yeah. So I've got to, let's, I want to, I want to wrap around. Uh, our topic here a little more. Did you ever, well, obviously, Kim, your grandmother had macular degeneration, but did you, did you ever think about the impact that you have on the, what you what you do for a living has on people who can't see and how much they need you and how much joy you bring them? I've actually talked to some friends of mine, uh, who have been losing their eyesight. And they said, one of the things that they love about audiobooks and the actors who bring them to life, and there's, as in any industry, there's good, bad, and indifferent. But what they adore is those who put everything in it. They said they can hear it, they can tell it, and it gives them back a sense of freedom and independence those being two very different things, but the independence, they don't have to wait for someone to read to them. They don't have to, many of the websites now, you can go in and listen to clips before you, try before you buy. I advise that, by the way. 
Um, there's nothing worse than getting a great book with a mm, not so great voice actor. They're out there. It happens. So try before you buy. But this freedom and then this this ability to go anywhere in the world on any topic, um, you know, whether you want to talk about swarm behavior in robots or why daffodils are different colors. There's just any manner of things. And they said that that is so freeing and they don't feel like they are dumbed down. Mm. Mm. So people sometimes feel, and I, I had a friend tell me this, that when her eyesight went away and hers went away very abruptly, there was no gradual. It was lights on, lights off. Mm -hmm. And she said she felt like she had to stop learning mm -hmm. because she didn't know how else to get the information. Yeah. So that's saved. Well, we get that, you know, we get that feedback all the time because uh, it's really, it's devastating to lose your vision. Vision loss is scary. And if you have to, re you have to rely on others to do things like read, you know, it's limiting. So Steve, what, what about you? Have you, have you ever you know, thought about the impact that, that you have on people who can't see because they can hear you in the stories that you're telling? To be honest, I, I don't think I've ever given it much thought to be specific about uh -huh. impacting visually impaired audiences. I just always try to make every story that I tell, every book that I voice, be so vividly expressed through my voice that you can see it anyway in your mind's eye. Whether you have vision uh -huh. or not, you should be able to, if you have good vision and you close your eyes, you should be able to see that picture just as vividly. So I always aim to to bring that, you know, mentally visual picture telling uh, with my with with my narration. I go very deep in my in my visualization. Kim knows this. I'll do exercises where I close my eyes and I become these characters and I can see and feel and smell and taste and hear everything that's going on in their world before I jump into it. And then I start narrating and I'm there. So hopefully I can pull you in with me. That's always my goal. Mm -hmm. You're almost like a transmitter. Yeah. I think you up. have to. You said it yourself, though. You close your eyes to do that. So yes. you have shut your eyes and then so therefore you're not seeing. So that's very interesting because people who can't see are doing that. That's what's happening to them. So that's kind of that's pretty deep, actually. It's good. I don't know if people understand how deep storytelling goes. Storytelling, vocal storytelling, is the first media of communication. And if you ever want a classic example, listen to a two-year-old tell you how they stubbed their toe or got their boo-boo. Mm. Yeah. They can take boo -boo stories. <laughs> a three-second event and tell it to you for hours. Oh and it gets God, you're bigger so right. each time. Think of that two-year-old running up going, I, I, I said, well, well, how did it happen? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I fell. And, and, but then it gets bigger. This is storytelling. This is, and Bobby pushed. This is storytelling at its finest. It is that innate. You have a two-year-old that will give you story storytelling it was only after storytelling did they start painting pictures on the cave walls storytelling yeah. came first yeah. this is why it grabs people kim's philosophy kim's theory well that's really cool but we've talked about the complexities of doing this but there's actually an underlying fundamental simplicity to storytelling yeah good as segue. well that has to be folded into the that's the, right the details of what you think about to crawl into character to do the narration right so, yeah, and, and we don't stop as adults. We continue, right? <laughs> you know, yeah. hey, man, you should have well, seen. Have I was standing there, and there was this stop. monster fish, man, and it came out of nowhere, and I reeled it in. I was working on it for hours, and I needed three extra beers. And you know, <laughs> What's the point of telling somebody something if you don't have a good story? I've been accused of telling too long and too de detailed of stories, and I know I do that, but I, uh, the details matter to me. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's part yeah. of the story. If you're not telling the story, if you say this guy came over and he had knocked on my door and then I got scared and he left, 
that's not a story. That's just reporting what happened. Right, right. <laughs> on this on this very high level. Yeah. The, the, the details bring it alive, right, Don? Right. So, yeah. Kim, what questions, like, what, what would you say? Do you get feedback from the listening audience? Do you get, yes. how's that work? You know, because I listen to a lot of the audiobooks and things that I've listened to over the years, you know, whether it's DVDs on or CDs or whatever in my car, you know, I'd rent them from the library. You know, how do you get feedback from the audience? Because you're, you're, you're recording these books. And so what happened? It is a lonely, it is a lonely thing, isn't it? Being alone with you and the microphone, you know, there's someone's ear out there in the future, but you're really doing it alone. But uh, tell us about that. Yeah. On, On most of the platforms where you can buy, download, or, you know, library loan, there's a feedback link. I suggest you always use it. You know, was this good? Were the characters clear? Could you understand them? The, the the most fun one I read for somebody else was, oh, my God, this voice actor had a mush mouth. And, and, and just the visual image of that was so clear. But then others are like, oh, my God, they brought the character to life. You know, this was really great. We get that feedback. And trust me, we all go in and read them. And it's it's not an egotistical thing. It's like, did was I truthful in, in acting? Yeah, that's good. Yeah, were you truthful? That's good. I like the truth. Were we truthful to the character? Were we truthful to the story? Did we bring it alive for the audience? And those are things we look for. So we get feedback in the days of social media. Do you get critiqued? Are there critics out there oh, yes. for audiobooks? Did you know that everybody's born with a red pen? And, and a highlighter? I thought it was only my college professor. <laughs> but no, we'll get... And in the days of social media, uh, we get, you know pinged and said, oh, I just listened to your book. That was amazing. It was wonderful. Why did you record it that way? Okay. Um, huh. <laughs> How do you answer a question like that, right? Yeah. In fact, Kim and I are working with, an, with a publisher right now in Berlin where they actually loop in yes. a crowdsourcing ah. for the casting process and for the performances themselves at an early stage. So they're constantly listening for that feedback to, to improve, quote, the product, which is fascinating. Interesting. Can you do something off the cuff about losing your vision or reading or sure. my grandmother's got macular degeneration or, you know, something like that? Like, it's a, Let's see what happens. <laughs> give it a shot. All right. <clears throat> hey, yeah. Uh, can you pass me that thing over there? I can't see it very good. You know, I'm losing my sight over here. I'm getting old. Uh, my eyes ain't what they used to be. Uh, of course, oh chap, uh, but you know, first I need to get my bifocals. Hold on, where have I put them? Um, uh, oh, here they are. They're, they're in my hand. <laughs> I've been holding them all along. Uh, yes, let me put my glasses on and um, what's the thing? What, what, what do you want me to get? Uh, you know, it's, um, it's like a deck of cards, but it's, it's more like um, it's a thing you play music on. Uh, oh, you mean like an iPod? Uh, whatever, you know, iPad, iPad, I, I poodle, whatever. Uh, <laughs> oh, yes, yes, okay. Um, um, so I've got an iPhone, I've got an iPad, I've got an iPod. You've got to be more specific, chap. Um, you know, why don't we ask um, uh, Joe? Uh, Joe, wh- which one of these do you think plays music? Well, you know, fellas, I don't listen to a whole lot of music out there on the range. I'm always on my horse. Yeah, I just listen to the sound of the wind whistling through the breeze of the trees out there with the cattle. So y'all find whatever you need, but uh, you know you're welcome to uh, to hang out just as long as you need to. <laughs> That's good. That's, That's all good. I got. It's good. It was good. Oh my gosh, I'm making up a story out of thin air. Here. I love it. Lightning round, Steve, and then Kim. Lightning round. Favorite book you have recorded. Probably first dog on earth. It was different than everything else I've ever done and just so beautifully written. First first book you recorded, Lightning Round. Let's see. I actually did a small uh, a series of abridged audiobooks, classic titles that were an hour or less, like Black Beauty, Red Badge of Courage, some Oscar Wilde children's stories. So that was my first audiobooks, some very short ones. Mine was a rather long one called Yogini's Dilemma. Uh-huh. Favorite book of yours? Not necessarily that you've recorded, but your favorite book, Lightning Round. Uh, probably the Harry Potter series. I read it all the time with my kids. 
Harry Potter as recorded by Jim Dale. That is my goal for performance is Jim Dale. Awesome. Awesome. And one more in the lightning round. What makes you happy? My kids and reading to them. Acting and bringing things to life. We can't thank you enough. This has been incredible. It's been a I've learned a lot. We hope the folks listening, right, David, have learned a lot and kind of understand the behind the scenes, the people's voices you hear and what it takes to get it out there. What do you think? Yeah, the work you guys are doing are amazing and you're really helping a lot of people experience story and books that they couldn't otherwise do. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having us. Thank you. My Mac Life. My Mac Life. My Mac Life. <laughs> this program is empowered by the Support Site Foundation. The Support Site Foundation mission is to save sight for millions of people who suffer from age related macular degeneration, AMD and lose their precious vision. As a 501c3 public charity, our goal is to provide patient education and access to low vision resources to help individuals, families, and caregivers whose lives are severely impacted by AMD. We place a high priority on connecting with people, their families, and loved ones who live with the daily struggle of impaired vision. The Support Site Foundation funds innovative research projects conducted by the top scientists in the field who are on a path to discover effective new tools, technology, and treatments for people like you with vision loss. The Support Site Foundation, supportsite.org, S-U-P-P-O-R-T-S-I-G-H-T dot org, or call us at 888-681-8773 and connect with us on social media. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. My name is Bill Kilroy. I'm Vispero's Senior Sales Director for the Northeast, and I'm joined by my colleague, Mike Wood, Strategic Accounts Manager for Education for Vispero. Hey, everybody. Mike and I are very pleased to be on this podcast, My MACD Life, and we hope to tell you a little bit more about our organization and the types of tools we produce. Vispero is the world's largest assistive technology for the visually impaired. Our field of specialty is assistive technology. In our world, for Vispero, that means serving people with our products who are blind or low vision. Throughout this podcast, we hope to highlight key products in our line that can enhance people's lives, and we look forward to speaking with you. So today, Bill and I are going to chat with you about one of our larger desktop units. So this unit's Portable, but not as portable as some of the other products we've talked about in the past here. So this product is the DaVinci Pro by Enhanced Vision. And, you know, the DaVinci Pro is a really high-performance desktop video magnifier. Uh, Many of you out there may know of video magnifiers or desktop video magnifiers as CCTVs, right? Um, So kind of interchangeable there. And the cool thing with this unit is that it's got a three-in-one camera that can do distance, close-up, Um, self-facing, you know, as close up or, you know, reading as well. It's got a full high definition 1080p camera. So, you know, the cool thing with these is those 1080p cameras and Bill, I'm sure, you know, you're out there using these at conferences or you're showing these in a home with somebody. One of the things they always say is like, they're shocked. You know, they're like, Ooh, you get the oohs and ahs, like the fireworks, right? When you show them how far this can zoom out uh, to look in the distance. It's amazing. Yeah. I used one of these actually, couple months, uh, well, now coming up on about a year for the spring, I had some eagles nesting in a, a tree in my yard, and I used one of these to zoom in and, and get like up close. I was watching them making the nest. And I mean, it's, you know, these are one of those things where it's like, all right, you know, here you can use it for reading, but you can use these for so many other things. Um, you know, it's great for applying makeup, which uh, I'm not wearing, uh, but shaving, which I also didn't do this morning. Reading, writing, for me, working with students, these are great in the classroom. You can view the smart board, you know, the whiteboard, the chalkboard, uh, depending on what school you're at. And you can also use this to kind of pan around the room and see, you know, if you're in a, a meeting, you could look at the your colleagues in the meeting 
or your classmates in class. Another thing that the DaVinci Pro adds in is the capability of OCR. And many of you have heard us talk about OCR in the past, right? It's optical character recognition. And more simply stated, it's scanning and reading. So if you've got a page of text that you want to have this product scan in, the DaVinci Pro can scan that and then read it out loud to you in multiple voices. You can customize the voices, uh, whether you want male or female. You can change the speed of that. Really customizable. When you're magnifying, you've got a 24-inch monitor. I mean, it's widescreen, 24-inch magnification, which allows you to get up to 77 times magnification. I mean, that's pretty high-powered, right? So you can use that to do your magnification, change the color contrasts. You've got 28 different viewing colors. So if you want to use black on white, white on black, you know, yellow on black, you name it, there's... 28 different color combinations that you can use. Well, I think, you know, one of the things you, you, you're touching on is, I mean, this thing is chock full of tons and tons of features and specifications, you know, that, I, I, I mean, it's, it, it, it is the top of the line. It has every feature that you'd want in a traditional desktop video magnifier. And it uses that, that um, three-in-one camera as the platform, which gives you some great versatility Traditional desktop CCTV, camera looking down, lighting system, XY table, moving your print material, your print object in and out, left and right um, to pan through, um, you know, reading material. But what I love about this, Mike, you, you nailed it with, with the personal viewing and the distance viewing. Yep. But also think about that three-in-one camera and the distance it provides from the bottom of the camera to, the let's say, the top of the XY table. Yep. Or it also swings out to the side, too. So – for you hobbyists out there, you know, we've all taken these types of products into companies that are doing manufacturing for inspection level type of stuff, um, circuit boards, um, you know, welds on uh, medical devices, you know, removing burrs, those types of things to make sure that something's perfectly smooth. I mean, the quality of the image is that good. So again, a lot of people will still do the the hobby type of things, whether it's you know stamp collecting or repairing computers, you know fixing you know just things that you you know we talk about crocheting, uh, knitting, doing a lot of stuff that where you have want a lot of work area under that camera. This is that type of device that can be versatile in all of those types of situations. And, you know, I, I, you, that's a great point. I know I've uh, worked with some people that were tying fly fishing lures underneath this, you know, so you can do all sorts of that stuff. And then as easy as something is viewing photos of your grandchildren or family, right? You know, I know around a couple months back around the holidays, uh, you're sending out holiday cards and people were loving the fact you can put that under these units and zoom right in and get a crisp, clean picture. Uh, and for those of you out there that are really tech savvy, you can also connect your computer to this unit and toggle between the CCTV and the computer, or you can connect it to your iPad as well. So this is a, like you, I think you had said, top of the line product, right? This is the top notch product, um, you know, well built, going to give you a lot of flexibility. It's going to grow with you. Uh, so as you learn more and more about it, you can do more and more with it. Uh, it does come with a two year warranty as well, which is always nice. I know we get a lot of questions from people, you know, what's the warranty on this? And so you've got a two year warranty from the manufacturer. And, the, and there's two, two levels of this device, too. I, I think let's, we can distinguish. They both do OCI. They're both 24 inch monitors. They both use you know, the high definition 1080p camera. But really, the, the, the functional difference is, is you know, the OCR capabilities that you have. Um, so you have a base model that's the you know, DaVinci H, HD you know, full page OCR. And that will do some basic OCR, basic full page OCR. The DaVinci Pro HD full OCR will give you a lot more flexibility in capturing a page, capturing a portion of a page, navigating the page, flipping back and forth between reading, meaning listening to what you are reading, and then to flip visually to view what you are reading. There's two different models that you can choose from. And I think let's let's see the pricing here is for the DaVinci HD with full page OCR, it's $3,295. If you wanted the DaVinci Pro HD with the OCR and with all that, the bells and whistles for the OCR, 
you're at $3,995. So nobody enters into these types of procurements easily, let's say. So, you know, we have partners around the country that we we contract with. And so if you want to, you know, go online and check out the product, you know, we have videos on these devices that you can you can see, you can download and read all the um, user's guides uh, that come with this before you make a purchase. But also, you know, it's key that we have channel partners that you can reach out to, that you can set up a demonstration with. They'll come to your home. Now, in this environment of COVID, you know, we've taken precautions. All of our channel partners, we've made sure that they have the proper PPE, follow protocols to keep them safe to keep you safe. So if you're comfortable having them in, we can make that happen. So you can go to vispero.com. That's www.visperro.com. And from there, you'll find links to all of the brands that we had mentioned earlier. So again, the, today we talked about the DaVinci Pro, and that is an enhanced vision product. You can also link to Freedom Scientific, Optilec, and the Paciello Group. Uh, and I would definitely highly recommend, you know, check out mymacdlife.org. That's M-Y-M-A-C-D-L-I-F-E dot org. There's a lot of tools out there. I think we've got a great set. So, you know, reach out to us and we'll connect you with the right partners that can, you know, understand your needs and uh, hopefully show you the tools that can improve your life. My Mac D Life was created by the Support Site Foundation to serve the macular degeneration community. This award-winning educational podcast is one of a kind and is an innovative way to strengthen and empower people who are living with Mac D. My Mac D Life is made possible by generous tax-deductible donations from people like you. To donate today, visit mymacdlife.org forward slash donate. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for spending time with us today. We're really glad you're here. Please come back. Yeah, it's definitely a privilege and a pleasure. And remember, for more information, please go to mymacdlife.org. We have all sorts of resources and info there for patients who have MACD and their families. And remember to join us next time on My MACD Life. Thanks for being with us on My Mac D Life, the podcast with a vision to bring hope, optimism, perspective, and education to our listeners. For more information and many great, incredible resources, visit mymacdlife.org. This program is supported by amazing listeners like you. During the season of giving, please consider a donation to keep our mission moving forward. Remember to subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Until next time, keep living with hope.